Hey, quantum friends. Welcome back for more quantum fun in physics, computer science, 219A. Good to see you again. I appreciate your loyalty. Now we're going to continue building on our discussion from last time on query complexity and separations between query complexity in the quantum and classical settings. So here we go. So last time, remember, we talked about, in the case of the black box model, the difference between classical and quantum queries. We have a box which, in principle, can handle coherent superpositions as queries, and to get a grasp of the power of quantum computing, we're going to want to compare the case in which the queries are limited to classical ones, that is computational basis states, in other words, bit strings, as opposed to coherent superpositions of those, of those bit strings, which we'll see in some cases can provide much additional power for solving certain problems. An example of that, which we discussed and analyzed last time was Simon's, Simon's problem, where we have a function from n bits to n bits. It satisfies a certain promise. And we saw that we can solve the problem of characterizing that function with a number of queries, which is linear in the size of the input to the function, the number of uh, input bits. Uh, that we query it with. Um, whereas in the classical case, in order to solve the same problem, even with randomized queries, the number of queries needed would be exponential in n. So this is an example of an oracle relative to which we can separate classical and quantum computing. We can say relative to that oracle, that BPP is not the same as BQP. Now, Simon's problem is not known to have practical applications. Today, I wanna to talk about a related problem which does have some practical impl implications. So this will be the problem of finding the period of a function. We have a black box which can evaluate the function we are promised that it's periodic, we're not told it's period, we need to determine the period. And here too, we're going to see that there is an exponential separation in query complexity between the quantum and classical settings. And the nice thing about this example is that all the processing that we need to do, well, this was true of Simon as well, the processing that we need to do aside from the queries is all of, is efficient to solve the problem, but to make it practical, we'd like to have a way of instantiating the black box in a situation where even if we know the structure of the function and how it's computed by the box, even so we can solve a hard problem. If we can compute the function efficiently, then we don't need the box. We can simulate the box by efficiently computing the function. And so what this example will be telling us is that for any efficiently computable function, efficiently computable classically, we can use a quantum computer to find the period of the function, if it's a periodic function. And that actually is a powerful result and we'll discuss next time how it is the crux of Shor's famous algorithm for finding the prime factors of large composite integers. So I remind you about Simon's problem. Uh, here's one way of formulating it. We're promised that a function f is a two to one function with the property that two different inputs are pre-images of the same output if and only if the bitwise XOR of the two inputs X and Y is the n bit string A. And the problem is to find A. And of course, the number of possibilities for A is 
exponential in n. So that's not a problem that we can find easily the solution by randomly querying the oracle with just classical queries. Uh, but quantumly, we were able to do it. We queried the box that evaluated the function with a superposition of input values. And then we measured the input register um, in the complementary basis. We did a bitwise Hadamard on the n bits, and then we measured in the computational basis. And it turned out that by doing so, we were sampling from strings which are orthogonal to the string A in the bitwise inner product. And if we repeat that enough times, uh, we can find n minus one binary vectors of length n, which are orthogonal to A, and that's enough to determine A. And it's, it's an easy computation at that point classically to find A. Okay. The problem that we're going to discuss today has a somewhat similar structure. Now we're considering a function which takes integers to bit strings, let's say to m bit strings. And now we're promised that the function maps two inputs to the same output, f of x is equal to f of y, if and only if the difference of x and y is some period of the function times an integer. And we're also promised that there's some upper bound on what that period is. Um, let's call it capital M. So another way of saying what the promise is, is that the function is peri periodic. Its period is less than or equal to M. And on its period, it is one to one. So if I keep incrementing the uh, value of the argument, if I think of the, the input as an integer, um, I keep adding one to the input value and I get a different output, different output, different output until I finally added R uh, to the input and then the, uh, the cycle repeats. We know that's the structure of the function. What we don't know is what is this period? We All we have is an upper bound on it. So the size of the input to the problem, we can take the number of, to be the number of bits that we need to specify that upper bound. So it's the log to the base two of that upper bound on the period. And so we're imagining that uh, M itself is an exponentially large number. It might be thousands of bits long there are a vast number of possibilities for what the period could be. And if we just tried random guessing, uh, we'd have, uh, we need a huge number, an exponential number of queries to find the period. Uh, we can also formulate this as a decision problem if we want to, uh, just as we can with Simon's problem. Uh, for example, it might be that there are two possibilities that there is such a period which is less than or equal to m or is that there is no such period. In the latter case, the function really is one-to-one -one on values of uh, x ranging from zero to m. And we wanna answer the question, which is it? Is it periodic with some non-trivial period or not? So say that as a decision problem, we can say this pro the problem is an NP relative to the Oracle. I just, have to give you as a witness the period itself, and you can evaluate the function by querying the box uh, twice um, with inputs x and y, whose differences are. And if you get the same output, uh, then you'll know indeed there is a period which is less than or equal to m, and that will answer the question in the case where it is periodic. The problem is not in BPP relative to the Oracle for, for the same reason that Simon's problem is not. If we're limited to classical queries, the only way we're gonna get information about the period is if we get lucky, if we happen to query the box with a pair of numbers, which is a multiple of the period, um, then we would learn something about it. But the period is so huge that uh, that's extremely unlikely. Uh, so we're thinking of that period as an exponentially large number. Uh, the input 
to the problem has a size which goes like the log of that. So for example, the same argument as with Simon's algorithm, suppose we make r to the one quarter queries. Each time we uh, make a pair of classical queries, the, um, the chance that uh, they get mapped to the same output, the probability is just one over r minus one because uh, once you've done one of the queries, um, then, um, you know, <laughs> you're, uh, of all the uh, other possible queries, just, uh, just that fraction of them will get mapped to, uh, to the same output. So the, um, we can bound the success probability if we have all together, say, r to the one quarter queries by saying how many pairs of input values do we have? Well, that's just the number of queries choose two. And each time we have a probability one over r minus one of hitting pay dirt. So the probability of success uh, is still exponentially small. It scales like uh, r to the minus one half. So even with an exponentially large number of queries, we have an exponentially small probability of successfully learning about the period if we're limited to classical queries. So the point of today's story is the situation will be much better if we can make quantum queries, if we can query in superposition. In fact, um, the quantum query complexity, as we'll see, is actually a constant. If you wanna have some uh, high, probability of success, it's enough to query just a constant number of times to uh, solve the period finding problem. That's even better than Simon's problem where we needed a number of queries, which was a linear in the input size. Here, it's actually a constant. And as a matter of fact, as was the case with Simon's problem, uh, the quantum post-processing needed to identify the period aside from uh, the queries themselves is something we can do efficiently. So as I've already said, for any function that we can compute efficiently, so we can turn the white, the black box into a white box, we can really evaluate ourselves. The solution to the period finding problem gives us a method for determining the period of that efficiently computable function in polynomial time. So the idea of the algorithm is quite similar to Simon's algorithm, which is why I told you about Simon's algorithm first. Um, except that you remember in Simon's algorithm, before measuring in the computational basis, we applied a Hadamard to all the bits. Here we're going to do something a little different because the problem is framed differently and we're considering a function on the integers and want to find a period, which is an additive integer, we're going to use the Fourier transform. Well, that's what people use in signal processing and physics to learn about periodic structure. They Fourier transform and they measure, and that's what we're going to do. The quantum Fourier transform is a unitary transformation. Well, I'll explain later in the lecture why it is that we can do it efficiently, but for the purpose of discussing query complexity, that's not even the point. It's just enough to know that it's some unitary transformation that we can do ourselves. And um, here's what it does. It does what you think it does. It takes a computational basis state X to a superposition of computational basis states with phases, which have the form E to the two pi I Y X over N. So N, capital N is here, the base of the Fourier transform. For our purposes, we can usually think of it as being two to the little n. Uh, if we're considering uh, performing the Fourier transform on, um, on n qubits, but um, for much of the discussion, that's not going to be so important. So I'm just going to call it capital N. Well, capital N is the dimension of a space to which we're applying this uh, unitary transformation. And as I guess you know, it's, uh, it, it, it has a simple inverse. The inverse of this unitary transformation has ex essentially the same structure except with a minus sign in the exponential instead of a plus sign. Um, 
Okay, I guess I said that already. So how's it gonna work? So just like in Simon's algorithm, we're going to query in superposition. We're going to prepare a uniform uh, superposition of all the input values. And I guess I kind of used a mixed notation here, but that's okay. Sometimes I said capital N and sometimes I said uh, two to the N. If we're really talking about how to make that uniform superposition, we already did it uh, in talking about Simon's problem. You just apply a Hadamard to every qubit if you start in the all zero state and that gives you that uniform superposition. Um, another way of doing it would be to use the, uh, the Fourier transform. If you apply the Fourier transform to uh, the all zero state, you get a uniform superposition. So if you have a way of efficiently doing that, um, that's another way to prepare the um, uniform superposition. But remember in the context of query complexity, we don't care about how hard it is. It's just some unitary transformation. So of course we can do it in principle. Remember to determine complexity, we only count queries in this setting we're considering now. But anyway, we prepare this uniform superposition and then we query. And so we're going to make this massively entangled state a lot like what happened in Simon's algorithm. We're gonna sum over all values of X in the input register that will be correlated with the corresponding value of F of X. And then we can imagine that we measure the output um, register, just like with Simon's problem, whether we really measure it or not doesn't matter because we're not going to use the, any information that we gain when we do the measurement. So we might as well do the measurement and throw the answer away, but that's really just the same thing as tracing out the answer register. Um, and then we get a mixed state in the input register, um, whether we measure or not, but for the purpose of describing how it works, it's convenient to imagine that we actually do measure. And so um, I guess I didn't say it, but let's suppose that the result of performing that measurement is that we get the outcome f of x0 or x0 is some uh, particular input value. And then what we prepare in the input register is a uniform superposition of all of the pre-images of that output value. And because of our assumption about uh, periodicity, those are equally uh, spaced. Um, separated by R, the period, okay? So what we've just managed to do is to prepare this uniform superposition of all the inputs that get mapped to the same value. So I can imagine this X zero is something less than R and then all the additional values are obtained by adding multiples of R. And I'm although I'm imagining that my function uh, can be defined on any integer, I'm not going to be so bold as, a, as to attempt to apply it to a uniform superposition of all integers. I'm only going to consider uh, summing uh, X from uh, values zero to N minus one where N is some very large integer. So the number of terms in the superposition is whatever the least integer is that is greater than or equal to n over r. That will be the number of values which are less than n, which um, get mapped to a particular output. Okay, so, so what we're gonna do, just like Simon's problem, except with the Fourier transform now, instead of the bitwise Hadamard, is we're going to take that input register, we're going to apply the quantum Fourier transform to it, and uh, then we're going to measure in the computational basis. Okay, so this is what the this is how the quantum Fourier transform is defined, a unitary transformation. I want to apply it to this uniform superposition. So I'm going to be summing over all the values of J. And for each one of the values of J, I'm going to have a sum over uh, all values of Y, as in the definition of the quantum Fourier transform over here and then a computational basis state Y. And the phase that appears will be e to the two pi i y over n times that input value x zero plus jr. So I factored that into a piece that 
depends on J and a piece that doesn't depend on J. Uh, the piece that doesn't depend on J is just the X zero part that gives me E to the two pi I X zero Y over N. And the piece that does depend on J has the uh, JR part multiplying two pi I Y over N. Okay, that is uh, when I perform the sum over J that gives me the coefficient, um, the amplitude for computational uh, basis state Y in this, uh, in this state of the register, assuming that we uh, you know, got this particular uh, output when we measured. And now when we measure Y, I wanna know what the probability distribution is for the measurement outcome. So I just take for each Y, the amplitude squared. And um, the, um, for once I fix Y, this phase that depends on X zero is just an overall phase. So that's not going to affect the probability of getting outcome Y when I take the absolute value squared of the amplitude. So the probability distribution isn't gonna care about X zero at all. That's why it wasn't really necessary for me to do the measurement. I don't need to know what X zero is. Um, or what f of x zero is. And uh, so then um, let's see what we've got. I guess I, for uh, reasons which uh, maybe will become clear, uh, I wrote one over n a, which is the square of this coefficient as a over n times one over a squared. So I put uh, an a over n in front and then inside the sum, which gets squared, I put a one over A and I did that because this is a sum of um, A terms. So that's the natural way to, uh, to normalize that sum. Now, what we're gonna see is that this probability distribution for the outcome of the measurement after we do the Fourier transform and after the query is a very strongly peak distribution. For most values of Y, it's very close to zero. And for some special values of y, um, there's an appreciable probability. That's what I mean by sharply peak. And from the value of y, uh, we're going to learn something about the period because where those peaks are has to do with what the value of r is. So we'd like to understand that work, how that works. And to um, keep things simple at first, let's suppose that n is a multiple of r. So the period actually happens to divide n, the dimension of the Hilbert space that we chose, the base of our Fourier transform. Of course, in practice, that's not very likely. Uh, n was just r's to choose. r is something we don't know. And uh, they're both exponentially large. But let's suppose it anyway, because things are very simple in that case. OK, so this is the sum that we have. And now I want to suppose that n over r is an integer, n is a multiple of r, and that will actually be a in this case. The number of uh, terms in the sum will be precisely that integer, n over r. And um, now in the case where y is equal to a, that is n over r times an integer, uh, the phase appearing here is exactly equal to one. And um, that means that um, we get A terms and we have the coefficient one over A. So the sum is going to be equal to one. And so the probability in that case, um, looks like I, for some reason left out the square here, but sorry about that. Anyway, the probability in that case is just gonna be this prefactor A over N, which is it actually is equal to uh, one over R. So in the case where Y is equal to A, that is N over R times an integer, uh, we're going to get the probability for that particular outcome to be one over R. Now, in fact, there are R such values, okay? so the probabilities all sum up to one. And that's already enough to see without doing any further calculation that for all the other values of Y, the probability is zero. For all the cases in which Y is a multiple of N over R, we get probability one over R and there are such cases. And for all other values of Y, 
we get zero. So in other words, when we query the box, evaluate the function with a coherent superposition of all possible input values, and then we Fourier transform the input register, and then we measure that input register, we are sampling uniformly from all the values of, let's say, y over n, um, which are equal to an integer k over r, where uh, k is an integer, OK? Well, there's a maximum value. I, I mean, it's not really all integers um, because uh, there's a maximum value of y. But uh, for, all, uh, for all the integer values of k such that, uh, such that y is less than or equal to n, uh, they all occur with equal probability. So just like in Simon's algorithm, we were sampling uniformly from something interesting, namely the values of the input that were orthogonal to um, the period we were trying to find for that, uh, that bitwise function for uh, the bit string A. Uh, here we're sampling uniformly from the values of Y, uh, which are of the form integer over R, and R is that, um, that period we're looking for, okay? But remember, so far we've made that assumption, that uh, unlikely assumption, uh, that n over r actually is an integer. So we wanna see what happens when that's not the case, the more realistic case. Well, things aren't that much different. Um, if n is not a multiple of r, as I'm about to show you, we'll still be um, sampling from values of, um, of y that are very, such that y over n is close to uh, k over r with an order one success probability and almost uniformly. So in other words, there are r values, r is that period, r values of y, uh, such that the difference between y over n and some integer over r is um, no larger than one over two n. Okay, so the idea here is, if you look at the values of y over n, they're equally spaced, rational numbers between uh, zero and one. The distance between successive numbers is one over n. And uh, so if I consider uh, any value of k over r, where k is an integer which is uh, less than or equal to r, then one of the values of y over n is going to be at least as close as half the distance uh, between those neighboring points. Um, and uh, they're separated by one over n, so half the distance is one over two n, okay? Take any value you want uh, in the unit interval, and there will be some y over n, which is at least within distance one over two n of that number, okay? So let's write y over n as k over r plus delta, where delta is some small deviation of y over n from an integer over r. And small means it's not gonna be larger than one over two n. And then uh, when we take the phase of uh, the exponential of two pi i, a uh, y over n, uh, rj, like we have here, that's going to be uh, this. It's going to be the exponential of 2 pi i k over r. That's what we had in the case where a was um, equal exactly to n over r, an integer. That was, uh, we, that was when delta was equal to zero. Now delta is small, so I have to keep that delta in there. It's not equal to zero. k over r plus delta times rj. But just as here, uh, the k over r part just gives me a trivial phase. The argument of the exponential is 2 pi i times an integer. Um, the only thing that matters is the delta. So the phase is actually going to be e to the 2 pi i delta rj. Okay. And now rj is not going to be larger than n, right? Um, and um, 
delta isn't going to be larger than 1 over 2n. So the argument of the exponential here is actually a 2 pi i times a number which in absolute value is less than 1 half. So that means the phase can range from um, e to the minus i pi over 2 to e to the i pi over 2. Um, I guess that's right. And um, that means all of the points are going to be on the same side of the unit circle, uh, all on the uh, right-hand side. And um, that means we're going to get constructive interference when we add up all these terms, OK? Um, they can, they might, uh, they're going to be distributed in some way around the unit circle. They won't all be sitting right at one, but they're all going to be on the right-hand side. And so when we add up all the phases, we're going to get a big number. And so we'll be able to get an order one probability of obtaining one of these values of y such that y over n plus k over r, y over n is minus k over r is less than one over two n. We're going to get a value like that with a total success probability, which is order one. Okay, that's what's going to happen in general. So what's going on is we're, we're using constructive interference to our advantage. There are certain values of y which are going to be useful to us. Those are the ones such that y over n is close to an integer over r. And uh, indeed, when y over n has that value, uh, constructive interference uh, makes that probability occur with some appreciable value. But all the phases destructively interfere when y doesn't satisfy that condition or when it's far from satisfying that condition. And so those values of y are going to occur only with a relatively small probability. OK, so well, let's be a little more quantitative about that. We just kind of have the picture now. Um, the um, sum that we have to do is just a geometric series, a finite geometric series. So that's an easy sum to do. I decided to write it in terms of the primitive uh, nth root of unity, which I called omega here. Um, so the sum is uh, e to the two, what we're summing over j is e to the 2 pi i j r y over n. That's what occurs in the expression for uh, the probability of y. And then we have to normalize that and take its absolute value squared. So in terms of omega, uh, we have omega to the r y raised to the power j. And we're summing j over these a values. And this is what the sum of the geometric series will be. Um, it's going to be this factor omega to the r y raised to the power a minus one in the numerator divided by omega to the r y minus one in the denominator. Omega equals e to the two pi i over n. Okay, so coming back to our expression for the probability of getting outcome y, uh, this is what I had written down before. Uh, here now I've done the sum. Um, substituted in this. And so that's the thing whose absolute value squared we have to take. Uh, of course, I can factor out a phase from the numerator and denominator. Uh, in the numerator, for example, once I do so, uh, this is going to be e to the i pi a r y over n minus e to the minus i pi a r y over n. So in other words, it's just up to a factor of 2i, the sine of an angle. Uh, we're going to take the square of that, and the two is going to divide out between numerator and denominator. So what I get in the numerator is the sine squared of pi a r y over n. In the denominator, um, there's no a, so it's just the sine squared of pi r y over n. And uh, well, again, we there really was a one over n a which I had written as taking an a out in front and putting a 1 over a squared. But anyway, here's that 1 over an a multiplying the expression I just described. OK. Now, for the values of y that I was just talking about, the values of y that I claim are going to occur 
when we make the measurement with appreciable probability, delta is a pretty small number. It's less than or equal to one over two n. And uh, remember, AR is also less than or equal to n, because A is the number of multiples of R that will fit in between uh, zero and n. And uh, well, this is just uh, a fact about the sine function. If the argument of the sine function is less than or equal to pi over two, if I take the sine of the argument divided by the argument um, in absolute value, that's going to be at least two over pi. You know when the argument is uh, close to zero, it's cl that's close to one. And the uh, smallest it can be is when um, the argument gets to be pi over two, when the sine is one and the argument is pi over two. So in other words, two over pi is a, um, a lower bound on, well, what I chose to write sine CX over CX, as long as CX in absolute value is less than or equal to pi over two. So what we have here is uh, sine CX over X, and the C's divide out. And I'm saying that's greater than or equal to two over pi C. And the reason I care about that is that's the kind of expression I have here, except that I squared it. So the one over NA still in front, we have this ratio of sine squared pi r delta divided by sine squared pi r delta. And according to uh, the bound that uh, I just stated, uh, we can say that that will be greater than or equal to one over NA times uh, the quantity 2a over pi, which gets squared because it's a sine squared divided by a sine squared. So now I've got an a squared in the denominator, sorry, an a squared in the numerator, an a in the denominator, an a over n overall, and um, two over pi quantity squared in front for our lower bound on the probability. And that's true for each one of the values of y, which are have the property that y over n is delta close to integer over r. But remember, there altogether are such values. So the total probability of getting one of those values is going to be r times this. r is equal to n over a. So um, the total probability of obtaining a value of y that satisfies this property, such that y over n is close to integer over r, is going to be at least 4 over pi squared, which is you know, a little better than 40%. Now the probability distribution isn't precisely uniform in K um, because uh, the delta can, uh, what I guess, yeah, I guess that's right. Because um, for different values of K, the delta might have different values, uh, but it's not very highly biased. All the values of K occur with uh, you know appreciable probability. So I'm getting a pretty fair sample of the possible values of K. Now remember, we have a promise in the formulation of the period finding problem. Uh, we know that R can't be larger than M. So now what we wanna do is choose N large enough so that we'll be able to infer a unique value of K over R, which we don't a priori know from what we do know, which is N and Y, the outcome of our measurement. And I claim, that choosing n to be at least as large as m squared will be good enough to do the job. If we choose n that large, then uh, whenever we um, obtain an outcome such that a y over n is within distance one over two n of some integer over r, uh, we'll be able to uh, find that rational number uh, k over r precisely from the known value of y and n. Oh, so why do I say that? Well, the, it's pretty simple. Suppose there are two rational numbers. Uh, here they are, a over s and b over t. I suppose they're not equal to one another, so their difference is not zero. Uh, what is their difference? Well, I can write it as some numerator, a t minus b s, divided by st, okay? And 
if both denominators are no larger than m, remember we're considering the case in which r is in the denominator and we know that r can't be larger than m, then this difference of rational numbers has to be at least as large as one over m squared, okay? And so what we're gonna to wanna to do is to choose our n to be at least as large as one over m squared. And then we know y over n and we want to, but now n might be much larger than the period, n could be you know, much larger than m. However, there will be a unique rational number which is within distance uh, one over two n of um, which has the, a denominator, which is less than M. See, I, cho I chose N large enough, so we get a fine enough sampling of the value of Y over N that there will be a unique rational number. We don't know what R is, but we know it can't be larger than M. We'll be able to find a unique rational number with a denominator, which is no larger than M. When we get those outcomes that occur with reasonable probability, with 40% probability. Okay, so every time we run our procedure, I'll remind you once more what it is. We create a uniform superposition. We query the function, the periodic function with that uniform superposition. We throw away the answer register. We apply the quantum Fourier transform to the input register, and then we measure. We get some value of y. Uh, we know the value of y over n. We chose n to be at least m squared. And now we'll be able to find the uh, rational number, which um, will be unique with the denominator R, which is um, no larger than M, which is in with, within distance one over two N of um, Y over N, okay? So that is gonna tell us something about the period. We will, at least with some reasonable success probability with this 40% a uh, 40.5% success probability, learn a rational number which has the form integer over R, where R is the period that we're trying to find. So it might be that K and R, K is, is uh, pretty much, uh, you know, randomly sampled um, from values which uh, can range from, uh, you know, from zero to R. Um, and uh, it might be that there's no common factor of K and R. And then we take that rational number that uh, we've determined, which has a denominator no larger than M, we reduce it to its lowest terms, make sure there are no common factors between numerator and denominator, and the denominator is R, we found R, hooray. And once we found R, it's easy to check that it's right, um, we can uh, query the function twice with x and x plus r and see that we get the same output. Um, it might be though that our randomly sampled value of k shares a, fac a, a common factor with r. And then the rational number that we learn is some uh, k1 over r1 say, uh, where we divided out that common factor. And then uh, the denominator is not R, but it is a factor of R, okay? Because we divided out something from numerator and denominator to get K1 over R1. So that R1 is going to be a factor of R. It's something that divides R. So we've definitely gained some useful information. We've learned something about R. But now we just keep going, okay? It turns out that R1 isn't the period. How do I know? Well, I, uh, I tried it. Um, now I queried with f of x and f of x plus r1, I didn't get the same answer. So I know the actual period is some multiple of r1, not r1 itself. So what do I do? I do the whole thing again. And with that 40.5% success probability, I'll get another value of y over n, which is very close to some integer over r very close meaning at least as close as one over two n. And um, so good, so I get another chance. And maybe this second time I get K2 over R2, 
uh, maybe the numerator and denominator had uh, you know no common factor, and um, I've learned R this time. But even if not, I still have a chance because it may be that the um, well, I guess I'm kind of changing my story a little bit. Um, oh, it's okay. The the, um, the values of k that I get, I didn't think I wrote the right the right thing here. Um, well, the idea is that um, if the um, the k I get the first time and the k prime I get the second time don't have a common factor with one another but they do have, both have a common factor with R, then I've learned uh, something about R in both cases. Now, if the K and the K prime have no common factor, then I've divided out different numbers from the denominator in the ratio K over R and the ratio K prime over R. And that means that R will be the least common multiple of the two denominators uh, that I found, R1 and R2, okay? Well, maybe it didn't work again. Or maybe uh, there was a common factor of the two values of K, um, but uh, that's okay, I do it again. And if um, after multiple trials, the values of k that I sample are um, don't have any common factor, uh, then it will be the case that the least common multiple of all of the denominators is equal to r. And I won't explain this in detail. There's a little bit about it in the notes. But in fact, if we sample random integers, less than some really big value, um, multiple times, then with high probability after a few trials, there will be no common factor of all the integers. Uh, it's just because the, the prime numbers thin out fast enough so that uh, there's not likely to be a prime number that uh, divides all of them. And uh, so that's good because after I've done it a few times, the values of K that I sample now have no common factor so I take the denominators of the rational number that I found in each case, take their least common multiple, and that's gonna be R. And so after a constant number of trials with high probability, we will succeed in finding R. There are two things I have to worry about. First of all, there's an almost 60% probability that when I sample, I don't get a value of Y over N, which is, uh, delta equals one over two n close to some k over r. Um, but, you know, after a few trials, I'll have, uh, you know, several instances in which it is true that y over n minus k over r is less than one over two n. And then I have to worry about the fact that the values of k that appeared randomly had common factors with r. But after I've done it a few more times, I'm not going to be encountering the same common factor um, more than once. And so when I take the least common multiple, things are good. And I found R. And that's how it works. That's how we can solve period finding with a constant um, number of queries. Pretty great. All right. Well, next time I'm going to talk about an application of that. But first, uh, to conclude this lecture, I'd like to say something about the quantum Fourier transform. For the query complexity argument, it wasn't important that I could do it efficiently, but for real applications, it's going to be very important. And I want to show you that I can. So again, the quantum Fourier transform is this unitary transformation. We want to find a circuit that does that. And for convenience, I'd like to consider now capital N to be two to the little n. And uh, an efficient circuit will be one which has a size which is polynomial and little n, or polynomial in the log of capital N, okay? 
So in the context of what I just said, uh, remember I wanted to choose N to be larger than M squared, where M is the upper bound that we're given on the, um, the period of the function. And uh, so what I'm going to do to use the Fourier transform in this form when the base N, capital N is two to the little n, is I'll choose N to be um, the smallest power of two that's larger than M squared. Okay. So to, to see how it works, it'll be nice to use the binary notation of um, an integer, which we're implicitly using anyway. I keep uh, referring to bit strings as integers. And what I mean by that is I'm thinking of the bit string as representing a, a binary expansion of the integer to be more explicit. Um, so X is an integer um, written in binary notation. It would be Xn minus one, Xn minus two, Xn minus three, blah, 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 X1, X0. Um, all together, an n bit string, and just to remind you what that means, each one of the x of j's is a binary digit. It's either zero or one. And so the integer is xn minus one times two to the n minus one. That's its most significant bit, plus x sub n minus two, two to the n minus two, the next to uh, most significant bit, blah, 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 down to x1 times two plus x0, the least significant bits. And same thing for y. y has a similar expansion. Um, y n minus one, two to the n minus one, plus y n minus two, two to n minus two, plus, and so on. Now what appears in the exponential, in the quantum Fourier transform, the amplitude, when I consider the uh, result of applying the quantum Fourier transform to computational basis state x, of the computational basis state y is this phase. Now, any piece of x, y over n, which is an integer, we're not gonna care about because that's not gonna contribute to the phase. We only care about the non-integer part. In other words, we subtract away the, um, the largest integer, uh, less than x, y over n, and, um, and then what we're left with is all that matters in determining the phase. Now, in our case, remember capital N is equal to two to the N. So I'm interested in X, Y over two to the N and I wanna throw away any integer part. So let's consider um, the terms and the expansion of X, Y over two to the N that depend on Y sub N minus one. Well, the only thing that's gonna matter is the product of Y sub N minus one and X zero because y sub n minus one times x one is going to be multiplying two to the n. So when I divide by two to the n, I just get one, that's an integer, it doesn't matter. So the only thing I'm gonna care about is two to the n minus one times y sub n minus one times x zero divided by two to the n. So that means uh, one half of the product of x zero and y n minus one. That's the only part that's gonna depend on y n minus one. And um, it's convenient here to use the binary decimal notation. That's kind of a oxymoron to say it that way, but I'm writing, writing fractions in, in terms of, you know, a quote unquote decimal point or binary point, if you like. So when I write point x zero, what I mean is x zero over two. If I write say point, x2, x1, x0, um, I mean x2 over 2 plus x1 over 4 plus x0 over 8, okay, and so on if there are more uh, bits going further to the right of the decimal point. So I'm going to write it this way, y n minus 1 times point x0. That's the only part that depends on y sub n minus 1. What depends on y sub n minus 2? Well, I'm not gonna care about y sub n minus two times x2 and x3 and so on, because that's gonna be multiplying something which is two to the n or a multiple of two to the n. So I get an integer when I divide by two to the n. There are only two terms I'm gonna care about involving y sub n minus two 
y sub n minus two times x zero times two to the n minus two over two to the n, that's one quarter y n minus two times x zero. So I'm putting that in here as 0 0.0 x zero or x zero in the second place to the right of the decimal point. That means x zero over four. And the other term I care about is y n minus two, two to the n minus two times x one times two. So that gives uh, n minus one powers of two. When I divide by two to the n, I get one half y sub n minus two times x one. And that's the, uh, the point x one here in the expression multiplying y sub n minus two. And so you see how it goes. Likewise, the terms that involve y n minus two are going to be one half time y n minus two times x two plus one quarter y, I said y n minus two, I guess I went and y sub n minus three. Uh, so one quarter y sub n minus three x1 plus one eighth y n minus three times x zero, and that's all, and so on. And finally, when I get down to the terms that involve um, y zero, now all of the bits in the binary expansion of x are going to matter uh, because when I divide by two to the n, I get a number which is less than one. Namely, I get one half x of n minus one plus one quarter x n minus two and, uh, and so on, all that multiplying y zero. So all that dropping the integer part is what I get from x y over two to the n. Now in the quantum Fourier transform, this amplitude is the phase e to the two pi i x y over n. And as you can see, because the exponential is now the exponential of a sum, I can of course write that as product of exponentials. And that's what I've done here. So it's the exponential of uh, this term, e to the two pi i y sub n minus one times point x zero plus the exponential, sorry, times the exponential of this term, e to the two pi i y sub n minus two uh, dot x one x zero and so on. Product, product, product. The last factor in the product is e to the two pi i y zero times this point n minus one, point x sub n minus one, x sub n minus two, dot, dot, dot. Okay. So now, actually, what we can see is this quantum Fourier transform is pretty simple. It maps a computational basis state to another product state. I claim that this expression, the what computational basis state X gets mapped to this superposition of basis states Y times phases can be written in this way. There's a one over square root of N associated with each one of the N qubits. And then I have um, in the most significant bit in the Y register, zero plus e to the two pi i dot x zero times one. In the next to most uh, significant bit, zero plus e to the two pi i dot x one x zero one and so on. And finally, for the least significant bit in the Y register, uh, zero plus e to the two pi i dot x sub n minus one, x sub n minus two dot 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 x zero one. So how do I see that's true? Well, of course, when you expand this out, this uh, tensor product that I've written here on the right, it contains all possible bit strings because I can take from each factor either the zero or the one. And each one of those bit strings is accompanied by a phase. And it's exactly the same phase as what I've written over here, or in fact, this phase. Because um, if the... Um, y sub j is equal to zero, then I don't get any phase at all, right? Because um, these, I get non-trivial phases here only associated with the bits of y equal to one, not the ones that are equal to zero. So you say, you see each time I pick a zero from the most significant, next most significant and so on bit of y, there's no phase, but each time I pick a one, 
there is an associated phase. And so here, this corresponds to y sub n minus one equals one. It picks up the phase e to the two pi i dot x zero, just like I had here. And here, if I choose a one in the next most significant bit, well, that's going to be associated with the phase, which is e to the two pi i y sub n minus two dot x one x zero, like I have here, and so on, all the way down. So the whole thing is a product state, but with the phases chosen just right, so as to um, match the phases in the Fourier transform associated with each one of the computational basis states, okay? So now I just have to convince you that preparing that state um, or mapping X to that state can be done by a relatively simple quantum circuit, which you probably won't be surprised to hear now that we see that it's just mapping it to a product state that shouldn't be so hard. And here is a circuit that does it. Um, well, I just uh, sketched it out for the case of, um, of three bits uh, to make it easy to see how it works. And then generalizing that to n bits is easy to understand once we see how it works in, in a simple special cases. So here's the circuit, the uh, three uh, input bits to the Fourier transform are labeled x0, x1, x2. I want my circuit to map that to um, the product of the three states that uh, we just talked about. Um, so this, it's just the n equals uh, three case of what I wrote down here. So one of the bits will be zero plus e to the two pi i dot x zero one. The next one will be zero plus e to the two pi i dot x one x zero one. And the next one zero plus e to the two pi i um, dot x two x one x zero. In each case, there's a one over square root of two to normalize it. So I claim this circuit does the job. Let's see how that works. Well, we talked before about how you can think about what the Hadamard does. You remember the Hadamard, the guy that maps the uh, basis of poly Z eigenstates to poly X eigenstates. So acting on a um, computational basis state, X sub K, oh, where X sub K is either zero or one, it takes it to the linear combination of zero and one, which either has a plus sign in the superposition when x sub k is equal to zero and a minus sign when x sub k is, uh, is equal to a one. And this is just another way of writing that. Um, e to the two pi i dot x k, well, that's e to the i pi, otherwise known as minus one, uh, when x k is one and it's one when x k is zero. So that's just a way of writing what the Hadamard does. Now in this circuit, you see, I also have conditional uh, rotations. These are rotations about the Z axis. Just to remind you of the notation, what does this mean where I have the dot and the R1? Well, that means I apply R1 conditioned on the value of X1. If X1 is equal to one, I apply R1 to uh, this X2 register. And if X1 is equal to zero, I don't do anything. And uh, same thing here, conditional R2. In, uh, when the X0 register reads one, I apply R2 to the um, X2 register. So what are these R1, R2, and so on? They are rotations about the Z axis up to an overall phase. In other words, they're diagonal matrices acting on qubits in the computational basis. They change the relative phase of the zero and the one by this phase factor, e to the i pi over two to the d. D you can think of as standing for distance. It's how far apart the two bits are. So I have R1 as what is conditionally applied for bits in the string that are distance one apart. By distance, I just mean you know, how they're placed in the binary expansion. And R sub two, when the bits are distance two apart and R sub three when they're three apart and so on. And each time the distance increases by one, the phase rotation gets smaller by a factor of two. So I have this e to the i pi over two to the d. 
So let's just walk through what this circuit does. Remember in the, this, incidentally, you'll notice I've done something kind of funny here. I changed the order of the bits. This is the going in, I have the X0, X1, and X2 registers. And what's coming out is the Y0, Y1, and Y2 registers in the, in the opposite order. That's just what, how it's a convenient way of writing what the circuit does. Um, <coughs> so in, the, in this uh, Y0 register, what I want is this state. That's what the Fourier transform is supposed to do in that register. And I claim uh, the circuit does that. So first of all, the Hadamard is applied. And here it's applied to the X2 register. So that's going to give me 0 plus e to the i 2 pi i dot X2. So that got the most significant bit right here. But I need the other two bits in this uh, decimal expansion. OK, well, R1 is going to help with that. It's going to apply a phase, which is e to the 2 pi i over 4 x1 um, if, um, if the state in the 2 register is 1, OK? Because you see r sub d is um, only going to do anything interesting to the basis state 1. It's just the identity acting on basis state 0, right? And saying that it's conditional just means that you take that phase and you raise it to a power, which is the x1 power. Well, that I can just as well write is e to the 2 pi i dot 0 x1 0, OK? Because it's x1 over 4 multiplying the 2 pi i. So that took care of the next bit. And then that the conditional r2 takes care of the last bit. Because if register 2 is a 1, it's going to um, apply the additional phase e to the i pi over 2 squared, or e to the 2 pi i over 2 cubed. Um, and that's going to give me the e to the 2 pi i dot 0, 0, x 0 that I need to complete the correct relative phase of these two basis states, 0 and 1. OK, same thing's going on here in the second register. First, I do the Hadamard. That's going to give me 0 plus e to the 2 pi i dot x1, 1. Very good. But I have to take care of that additional phase. Uh, so I get the x0, the next um, most significant bit in the phase. And that's what the conditional r1 is going to do. Because if x0 is equal to 1, then it's going to give me an extra phase e to the 2 pi i uh, over 4, or x0 over 4. And uh, that makes this phase right. And in this case, there's really nothing to do except the Hadamard. Um, that's going to take the um, input value x0 to um, 1 over square root of 2, 0 plus e to the 2 pi i dot x0, 1, because that's what the Hadamard does. So we did it with this simple circuit. It's the Fourier transform applied to three bits. And I think you see how it works if I want to do it for n bits. I'm going to do the conditional rotations um, in the appropriate order. So I'll apply conditional. Uh, here I have the, the most significant bit of the input. That's going to get mapped to the least significant bit of the output. I do the Hadamard on that most significant bit. The conditional rotations that act on that most significant bit. Now I'm done with the most significant bit. I've taken care of it. The angle of rotation uh, falls off with the distance, like uh, 1 over 2 to the d. When I'm done with uh, the most significant bit, I get to the next one. First, I do the Hadamard. Then I do the conditional rotations to get the rest of the phase, and, and so on. So in all, if we have n bits, they're going to be n Hadamards. And there are going to be as many conditional rotations as there are pairs of bits, so n choose 2. That means I have n Hadamards, and I have n times n minus 1 over 2 of these controlled rotation gates, 2 qubit gates, all together, n times n plus 1 over 2 gates. So the circuit has a size, a number of gates, which is just quadratic in n. Pretty simple circuit. Incidentally, 
since we're going to measure right after we do the Fourier transform, we can make it even simpler. We don't even need to do those two qubit gates. It's enough to measure the qubits in the right order. And then after measuring, apply rotations to other qubits, which have not yet been measured, conditioned on the measurement outcomes that we've gotten so far. And let me explain that a little better. Well, you know, I, this um, notation I'm using is a little deceptive. I, it looks like it treats the control qubit and the target qubit for the rotation in kind of an asymmetric way. One is the control and one is the target. But in fact, it's completely symmetric between the control and the target. Another way of saying what it does is that if you consider the four basis states for the two qubits, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, it doesn't do anything unless the state is 1, 1. And this non-trivial phase gets applied only to the state 1, 1. So I could just as well write it the other way. I could write the controlled R1 with the X2 register as the control and the X1 register as the uh, target. And it's exactly the same thing. Now, why is it convenient to look at it that way? I like doing it this way because I thought it made it a little easier to see how the circuit works. But I'll get exactly the same probability distribution from the measurement outcomes if I Fourier transform and then measure, if I do it a different way. Namely, I start with that most significant bit. And um, I uh, apply the Hadamard and then I measure. Well, it's the most significant bit of the input, but it, it's the least significant bit of uh, the output. Um, when I measure, I um, then, if I get the value zero, I don't do anything more. If I get the value one, then I apply rotations to the uh, other registers. So let's stick with the uh, three qubit example. Um, so I measure the um, Y zero register, uh, which is really the same thing as the X two register. I get the value zero, I don't do anything. If I get the value one, then I apply the R one rotation to the um, X one register. And I apply the R two rotation to the X zero register. You see, because um, here I applied conditional rotations uh, conditioned on X2 to the X1 and X0 registers, but then I measured. So since I'm measuring in the zero one basis, I know whether the uh, control bit is a zero or one once I've measured it. And so if it's a zero, then the controlled unitary wouldn't have done anything. If it's a one, it would have done the rotation so if I measure it, I know it's a one, it's not too late for me to do that rotation because I haven't measured the target yet. And I apply in the case that the measurement gives a one, R1 to the X1 register and R2 to the X0 register, right? And then I can go on like that. For the X1 register, I do the Hadamard first, then I measure. If I get the result zero, I don't do anything. If I get the result one, well then, this gate, which I can think of as controlled by the X1 register with the X0 at the, at the target, now I just apply R1 to the X0 register if the out, outcome was one. And then uh, there's only one more to measure. First I do the Hadamard, then I measure. Now I'm done. And I'm gonna get exactly the same distribution of outcomes doing it that way as uh, if I did the Fourier transform and then measured using uh, the circuit that I wrote down in the first place. So that's really simple because we never have to do two qubit gates to uh, do the Fourier transform. We only have to do Hadamards and single qubit rotations by angles which are, uh, you know, pi over two to the D and, uh, and then measure, so that's it. Okay, so I've explained how to do the quantum Fourier transform, not important for the query complexity argument,
but very important if we want to use the quantum Fourier transform in uh, real applications because we want to be able to do it efficiently on a quantum computer and we can. And it's actually a very beautiful and remarkable thing that we can. Fourier transforms are pretty useful. They're useful for, they're often used in engineering and in physics applications for identifying periodic structure for extracting signals from uh, noisy situations. And the quantum Fourier transform will play that role for us in um, applications of quantum computing. So the thing that we learned here that was pretty cool is that entanglement and superposition are playing an essential role in giving us this quantum speed up. For one thing, we made this very highly entangled state when we query, because we got uh, a complicated correlation between the input and output registers when we did so. Uh, but then constructive interference was the key to our story, that there were special values of Y that we hoped to find when we measured. And because of phases adding up constructively, those special good values of Y occurred when we made the measurement with appreciable probability. The bad values of Y, which wouldn't teach us anything, occur only with very low probability. So we have a randomized algorithm, uh, which is useful and indeed can be used for solving period finding and really can be used to find the periods of functions that we can compute efficiently ourselves. So I think that will be enough for today. And next time, I'd like to talk about how we can use the ability to find a period to factor large numbers of Peter Shore's great discovery. All right, see you next time. Be well, take care of yourselves. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.